Let's see what happens when charges move through magnetic fields. Here's a basic experimental setup. Uh, these coils here are called Helmholtz coils. And they're used a lot to produce a uniform uh, magnetic fields in the same way that a solenoid can produce a uniform magnetic field. Turns out the distance between the coils here um, will be equal to the radius of the coils. And if you do that, you get a very uniform field that will be either be going into or out of the coil. So I'll represent that, that field. Let's say the magnetic field is going into the coil itself. So there's B. And what's happening in this, this experiment is actually used to determine the ratio of the charge of the electron to its mass. Um, so some electrons would be fired into that magnetic field. And they, uh, previous to that, they would be accelerated between some plates and there would be a certain voltage across those plates. And we know how to determine the kinetic energy and the speed of charges when they're accelerated between plates. So we could have a known velocity for these charges. And we'd also know the charge because it's an electron moving into that magnetic field. So the general situation, we've got a charge moving at a given velocity, and it's going into a magnetic field that's perpendicular to that motion. Now, if that's the case, the force, of course, is going to get bigger if you've got a bigger charge. It's going to be bigger if you've got more speed, and it's going to be bigger if you've got a bigger magnetic field. And in fact, in SI units, this is the formula that we would use to calculate the force on this charge. Now, now in a few minutes what we're going to do is look at what happens if the velocity is not perpendicular but has a component along the magnetic field and then we our formula would actually equal Q times the component of the speed of the velocity that's perpendicular to that magnetic field and that turns out to be equal to QVB sine theta. So this gives us the magnitude of the force. Now the other thing we need to know is what's the direction of that force going to be and then what's the resultant motion going to be. Now we have a hand rule and if we've got a positive charge then we always use our right hand. And the rule is like this. The first thing you do is point your fingers in the direction that the charges are moving. And then you flip your hand so that the palm of your hand will be in the same direction the magnetic field. So in this case here I'd like to have my palm facing into the board. And if that's the case my thumb would end up being on this side of my hand. And that would be the direction of the force. So here's B in. And effectively what happens there is you can only curl your fingers one direction. You can only curl them towards your palm and not away from your palm. Uh, and, and so effectively what your hand is doing here is kind of marking out a little plane. There's a plane here that goes in the direction your fingers curl as they curl from the direction of the velocity to the direction of the magnetic field. And the force is always perpendicular to that. So in this case here we'd have our velocity right in this direction and the magnetic field into the page so our force would be upwards. Of course that's going to bend the motion so that it looks something like this. And then if we do the same process with our hands again a short time later we would find that the force would be like that. The force is always perpendicular to the velocity. And what we would get is uniform circular motion. You can see that that force is always directed towards the center of a circle. So the resultant motion is uniform circular motion. And it's always circling about the field lines. So if the charges just came along and then entered the magnetic field, they'd do a semicircle and then they'd exit that magnetic field. But if our magnetic field were continuous and we started our charges, we accelerated our charges and let them loose inside that magnetic field, then we get that circular motion, uniform circular motion, where the force is always perpendicular to the velocity. And briefly, and this should be a bit of a review about work, but I think it's an important idea to mention now, uh, to notice that the force and velocity, they're always perpendicular to one another as we've been saying. 
And that means the force doesn't do work. Because remember, work was the only the component of the force that's in the same direction as the displacement. And instantaneously, the displacement and the velocity have the same direction. So if we're perpendicular, this f parallel is going to be 0. And being as work is equal to the change in energy, that means we're not going to have any energy transformations. And that means that our kinetic energy and our speed is constant. Of course, it wouldn't be uniform circular motion if we didn't have constant speed. I'd like you to practice a bit with the hand rule. So we're going to assume we've got some positive charges. I'm going to give you the direction of the velocity and the direction of the magnetic field. What I'd like you to do is pause the video and move your hand around and see what the direction of the force will be. Remember that force will always be perpendicular to the plane formed by the velocity and the magnetic field. So stop the video and try the first question. Okay, so hopefully what you did was you, first of all, pointed your fingers in the direction of the velocity, like so, and then <coughs> got your palm orientated in the direction of the magnetic field, and then your thumb, which is pointing out of the board, would be the direction of the force. So in the first one, the force is out of the page. Second example, once again, assume it's a positive charge, so use your right hand. Pause the video and try that now. Okay, so the fingers are supposed to point down with the velocity, get the palm in the direction of the B field, and then your thumb is pointing out of the page, which is the direction of the force. Another example, once again, positive charge, you use your right hand, stop the video, and come back for the answer. Okay, so in this case we want to get, first of all, our fingers coming out of the page. So our fingers are coming out. Get your palm in the direction of the magnetic field, and that will mean your force is upwards. Okay, let's take a look at what happens when we move a positively charged particle into a magnetic field. But this time we've got a component of the velocity that's parallel to the magnetic field. We've also got a perpendicular component. Now the force is going to equal Q times V perpendicular times the B field. Uh, being as V perpendicular over V is equal to the sine of theta, that means that V perpendicular is equal to V sine theta. So this could be written as Q V sine theta times B, or it's usually written as Q V B sine theta. And V here would just be the speed of the particle. So what's going to happen is this parallel component, it's not going to be affected at all. It'll just keep moving with constant speed V parallel in this direction. However, this component here, and you can use your hand rule, you would get a force that would be directed such that the particle would circle the field lines. So if there's no parallel component, we would just be kind of circling, circling the field lines like that. Now if we add that parallel component, of course, the particle moves along at that constant speed to the right, and then it keeps circling the field, field lines, and we get what's called a helical path. So important point to, to note is that, that any component of the velocity that's parallel to the field lines generates no, no magnetic force whatsoever. And it's only this component that's going to be affected by the magnetic field and is going to produce that circular motion. Okay, so here's an IB question about exactly that topic. What I'd like you to do is pause the video, read the question over, try it, and come back for the answer. Okay, now hopefully you said the answer is A. Because in this case here, all the velocity is parallel to the magnetic field. And that means 
there's not going to be any magnetic force whatsoever and the particle is just going to keep doing what it's doing because it's not being acted upon by any force. If we were to come in at a bit of an angle, then of course we would get this answer here. Okay, a second question. Once again, I'd like you to pause the video, read it over, try the question, and then come back for the answer. In the first part, you're just accelerating an electron between parallel plates. And so the, the amount of electric potential energy loss, Q delta V, will equal the amount of kinetic energy gained a half mv squared. And we can rearrange that so that V will be equal to 2 I'm going to write, instead of Q, I'm going to write E because it's the electron charge and times delta V and we got to divide by the mass and take the square root of the whole thing. So if we do that and plug in the numbers, so it'll be 2. Charge of an electron is that 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. We're accelerating it through some 250 volts and our mass, you can look that up in the data booklet, it's 9.1 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms for an electron. And now if you plug those numbers in, you should get this answer here for the speed of the electron after it is accelerated between those plates. In the second part of the question, we can say that the only force acting is that magnetic force. If I write F equals MA, the only force acting is QVB. And being as it's uniform circular motion, we we'll always get uniform circular motion in the, when we send a particle with a velocity perpendicular to the magnetic field, and that means I can write the centripetal force as MV squared over R. And then if I rewrite that for R, I'm going to get that, I'll get one of the V's cancelling out, so I'll get MV all over QB is equal to the radius of the motion. So that would be the, the radius of this here. And so now if I solve, my radius will be the mass of the electron, that 9.1 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. The speed is, from the last question, 9.4 times 10 to the 6 meters per second. And then we want to divide by the charge of an electron, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs and the magnetic field was 0.12 teslas. Those are all SI units, so we're going to get an answer in meters. Okay, and that comes out to be 4.46 times 10 to the minus 4 meters, which of course rounds to 4.5 times 10 to the minus 4 meters. Make sure when you're doing questions like this where you are given the final answer that you fully show your numerical substitutions into the formula. Okay, another question once again. Pause the video, try the question, and come back for the answer. So the first thing you should recognize is that if you've got a proton and an electron, they've got opposite charges. And of course, we'd use the right-hand rule for the proton, the left-hand rule for the electron. And if you do that, you should find that the proton should be the one that bends upwards, and the electron is the one that bends downwards. So we can eliminate these two choices here. Now the other thing we have to consider is which one's going to execute a larger radius. Thinking in very simple terms, a proton has a lot more inertia, a lot more mass than an electron. If something's got more mass, that means it's harder to accelerate. And that means it's going to be harder to make it turn, and it'll turn in a bigger circle. And that means your correct answer should be B. So the proton is the one with more inertia, and that should give a larger radius. If you don't see that, uh, then you can always go back to the formula and say that QVB equals mv squared over r. In other words, the, the magnetic force is uh, supplying the centripetal motion. And when you rearrange that, of course, r is equal to mv all over QB. And that means that uh, radius varies as mass. Bigger masses execute circles with a larger radius. Okay, so once again, pause the video, try the question, and come back for the answer. First thing you've got to do is decide in which direction are those magnetic field lines going to circle the wire itself. So you've got to go back to that old hand rule, and you'd have your, sort of your fingers curling around this way, and your thumb in the direction of the current. So the, the field lines are supposed to circle 
in this direction, coming down like that. Which means that if we're considering the plane of the paper, then the field lines are going to go into the plane of the paper on this side and out of the plane of the paper on this side. And remember, the field gets weaker as you go out farther. Once again, now we've got to use our other hand rule and determine in what direction will the force be on this. It's a negative charge, so we should use our left hand, point our fingers in the direction of the direction the charges are moving, and then get our palm in the direction of the magnetic field. So our palm should be into the page on that side of the wire. And with our left hand, that means our force is going to be directed along the wire, parallel to I. Okay, another question. Uh, once again, I'd like you to pause the video, try the question, and then come back for the answer. Okay, so the first thing we've got to decide is we know that this electron is going to be slowing down. So what we need to determine is if a particle is moving more slowly, will it go to a larger or a smaller radius? And we can use that idea that the magnetic force is supplying the centripetal force. So QVB has to equal mv squared over r, which means that the radius is going to equal mv all over QB. So we've used that equation quite a few times. And so basically, if you've got a bigger radius, that means you've got a bigger velocity. And that means if the particle's slowing down, it's going to go towards a smaller radius. And that means it's got to be circling this way in a counterclockwise direction. Now, we have to use our left-hand rule in order to get the direction of the magnetic field. And in this case here, we would have our hand would be kind of, if the magnetic field, that's our palm. This is our, our thumb, which would be the force. This is our velocity. So there's the velocity. There's the force. And our palm is going out of the page for that orientation. And that means the magnetic field must be out of the plane of the paper. So the correct answer there is D. OK, now let's try to just briefly summarize the forces that act on charges when they're in magnetic fields. So the magnitude of the force we said was given by QVB sine theta. And in a lot of cases, that reduces to QVB if V is perpendicular to the magnetic field. And the direction of the force, we had to use the right-hand rule if it's a positive charge, and the left-hand rule if it was a negative charge. And we would put our fingers along the direction of motion, our palm points in the direction of the magnetic field, and the force will be perpendicular to that plane formed by the velocity and the magnetic field. And then the magnetic force, it always produces a turning motion, a centripetal force. And that means you're either going to get a circular motion if V and B are perpendicular, or you'll get the helical motion if there is a component of the velocity that's parallel to B. And that's all for today, folks. Thank you very much.